Hey there, and welcome to The Cozy Corner, a podcast about all things cozy. Join us as we dive into the world of film and TV, a little true crime and spooky time, food reviews, and talk to some special guests too. So get cozy, grab some snacks, and settle in, because we're about to begin. Hello, and welcome back to another review episode of Cozy Corner. Thanks so much for tuning in. For any new listeners, my name's Emily and today I'm flying solo to give you my review of my new favourite TV series. My co-host Abby isn't too well at the moment, but she is doing much better now and will hopefully be returning to the podcast very soon. We're sending you lots of love and well wishes Abby, we miss you! On today's episode I'll be reviewing in depth the new hit show Dead Hot, available on Amazon Prime and Tubi. Now this show in itself is dead hot. It is just so hot right now. It's all over my For You page and I'm just here for it. Before we begin, make sure you're subscribed to Cozy Corner on your favourite podcast app. Head over to YouTube and watch the video version of these episodes. Join in the conversation and tell us your thoughts on this show over on our socials linked in the show notes below. Make sure to check those out. And spoiler alert, for those who haven't seen it yet, pause this, go watch Dead Hot, come back and listen to the review. Because I don't want to spoil anything for you. Okay, this is a show where if something is spoiled, it's ruined. Okay? So please, avoid spoilers at all costs if you haven't seen it. Pause this, and then come back when you've seen it. And then you'll get what I'm on about then. You'll know what I'm talking about, Okay? So promise me you'll go do that, yeah? Make yourself a cup of tea, go watch it. And if you've already seen it, then settle in and enjoy. Because this is going to be in-depth, okay? I'm going to be giving you all my thoughts on this. And if you've got any thoughts that you want to add or anything that you think I miss out, head over to our socials, linked below, and share your thoughts on Dead Hot. So, what is Dead Hot all about? Well, it's a comedy thriller mystery created by Charlotte Coburn, which follows Elliot, who comes home to find his soulmate Peter has vanished, with nothing left behind but his finger in a puddle of blood. Still living with Peter's twin, Jess, they don't know if he ran away, was kidnapped, or worse. Elliot tries to move on, and after a magical date with the wonderful Will, That actually seems possible. But when shit hits the fan, Elliot and Jess know they need to find out the truth. It explores themes of class, love, identity and friendship and a lot of friendship to do with Elliot and Jess. They were brought together by the loss of Peter, which is quite an important aspect in the show. This series is created by the wonderful Charlotte Coburn, who is the daughter of famous American writer Harlan Coburn. So if if you're into like um, crime and thrillers, you probably know that name. She is best known for Fool Me Once and Stay Close on Netflix, both of which has had great success. I really enjoyed Fool Me Once. That was brilliant. I thought that was amazing. And they actually, they did a funny thing on socials, you know, for April Fool's Day. They said that they were coming out with a fool me twice. And you know what? They almost had me. They almost did fool me. Like, it was, I was so close to believing it. I read it for a minute and I was like, what? Oh, oh no, April Fool's. <laughs> so I thought that the social team for, is it Key Street Productions or Quay Street? I never know how you say that. I should do because I live in Liverpool and we've got a lot of them. Um, We've got a lot of keys or quays or whatever they're called. But anyway, the production company, um, I I would like to find out how to say that. Um, They did a great job with like the social media for April Fools on that. Because that was the perfect one to do that way. So, well done to them. I also like to stay close but not as much as Fool Me Once. I thought Fool Me Once, that had so much like intrigue and mystery and uh it had michelle keegan in it as well so you can't really go wrong with that but anyway moving on so i don't think i've watched the show and been as obsessed 
as I have before as like with dead hot it's I literally can't stop thinking about it it's one of those where it's a bit of like a mind boggle but you can't stop watching it and I haven't had something like that in a long time where it's really gripped me from the get-go so I I've, I've just feel like it's brilliant it's not it's like nothing I've seen before it takes all the boxes of everything that I like in entertainment it, it has literally got everything it's got a mysterious disappearing comedic moments bizarre antics all the family drama you could ever want or not want corruption romance love and unbreakable friendships and if you've got one of those friendships yourself you can't help but relate to Elliot and Jess like it's just that connection where you're like yeah <laughs> like they would be friends in any scenario like no matter what they're always going to be friends and there's actually a moment in the show where <laughs> this random in in the club this random like medium or psychic comes up to them and like everyone's drunk and the he, he says to them like oh i can tell you have been friends like forever and they just kind of brushed it off it's like oh yeah yeah we've always been friends and he was like no 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 past lives like you two were oh, something like seaweed on a on slabs of rock in the baltic sea or something like that and everyone obviously is drunk and like kind of out of their heads a bit <laughs> but they're like yeah oh my god we so were like but you get that feeling from their friendship like honestly no matter what throughout all their past lives yeah they would have been friends and i feel like that with my bestie like we have probably been friends in past lives i just can't see us never not being friends so it's very much got that like true friendship connection where you recognize it like you can see somehow they've been able to replicate that in a tv show and that's hard to do so let's dive into the review then what i love right off the bat about this story is how it immediately plonks us right in the middle of the action keeping us hooked on every line and shot it doesn't make you wait to reveal and build up to the mystery it just throws you straight into the heart of the drama and it keeps you guessing throughout like you just don't know what's gonna happen next you think you do and then you're like oh no literally the least thing that i suspected happened instead <laughs> There was impeccable acting throughout as well, creating intriguing drama with a great lineup of casting. I thought the casting department was phenomenal on this. I can't picture anyone else playing Elliot other than... Now, I'm not great with name pronunciations, so please, if I butcher this, my apologies my name itself is also a bit of a weird one and like odd spellings so i get it all the time so many times i've been called a meal and it happens that much that i just go along with it now so if i pronounce this wrong i'm so sorry um but i think the main actor is called bilal ha hassan bilal hassan and then there's of course um Vi vivian as well Vi vivian i want to say Oprah but I don't think that's right again I'm awful with names and I'm dyslexic so we're just gonna mainly blame the dyslexic because no one can get mad at me for that um and of course Marcus Hudson and there's just so many different people in this way I've seen them before in some stuff but you wouldn't automatically think that they'll be in something like this. Yeah, it, it does work really, really well. Um, so where have we seen these actors before? Well, you might recognise the main character played by um, Bilal from Disney Plus's Extraordinary and a small part in Netflix's Free Body Problem. And I've just recently watched both of those, actually. I watched season two of Extraordinary and then the new um free body problem and 
I think he is an incredible actor. He's got such a charisma about him. I can't like pinpoint exactly what, but mo- I mean, I've only ever seen him in roles where he's not typecast. I wouldn't say he is, but most of the roles that he's in, he plays like a nice person. <laughs> you know, like someone who you like. Oh, they're so nice. But the difference between Elliot in Dead Hot and then his character in Extraordinary, they are very different people. But they also have incredibly different personalities where you could see Elliot being someone who's so nice and caring, would do anything for their friends, and is very selfless. Whereas in Extraordinary, um, his character, whose name I have forgotten now, it might come to me, I might scream it in a bit, I might remember it and go, ah, that's his name. Um, but he's actually quite selfish and it it seems like he's still quite nice. There's a nice side to him, definitely, but he can't really see past his own nose a lot of the time. So it's interesting to see him play those two different types of characters who are still the very earnest, the very honest and caring, yet they still have those differences. So we, I wouldn't say he's typecast, but I do often see him in in those kind of nice character roles. And I think he plays it really well, especially for Elliot. I just can't imagine someone else playing him because he's just he's so lovely and sweet. And you can just see that, like, the actor playing him is enjoying playing that character. I don't think you could fake that, like... I feel like he must have some similarities to him and he's letting those really shine through. Um, And of course in this as well, we've also got someone who is actually from Liverpool. Now I didn't know this. Like I've seen him in loads of stuff, but I didn't know he was from Liverpool. And I thought, is he putting on an accent? But it sounds real, so I googled it. And now he's actually from Liverpool. I am going to struggle saying his last name, but we're going to work through it together, okay? Peter Serafinowicz. Peter Serafinowicz. 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 I'm sorry. I mean, my last name is McMahon. So, you know, some people struggle with that. I'm just going to say I'm dyslexic, which I am. Um, a local Scouse actor, of course, and he's been in extensive list of productions, including Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy. I knew I recognised him. Like, when I was watching it, I was like, I know this guy, but what from? <clears throat> so when I googled him, immediately that came up, and I was like, oh my god, he's that guy. He's that guy from Guardians of the Galaxy. So, I'm glad that I worked out where I know him from the most. But, he's also appeared in many other productions, such as Shaun of the Dead, 2015 Spy, His Dark Materials, the 2022 comedy The Bubble, which I think is really underrated, The School for Good and Evil, a small role in Parks and Rec, which I remember, and I was like, oh my god, yeah, and he was in that. And Netflix's new re- ne- newly... I'm struggling today with words. Good God. Newly released show, also filmed in Liverpool, The Gentleman, which I still need to check out. It's on my list. Um, so yeah, I am fascinated that I did not know much about this person. But now I do. I've I've researched their filmography. Um, and, and they are a really good actor. I enjoy Peter's work. He always tends to play the villain, but you know what? He's got a face for it. <laughs> like, he's got one of those faces where you're like, oh, I love to hate you. Like, I'm I'm not being mean. I'm not. He just has a villain face. He pulls it off so well. So well. Like, he is made to play the role of villains. And more importantly, likeable villains like you you kind of like them they have a charm about them yeah he's just so good at playing that villain and sometimes like a cheesy villain but he pulls it off really well so i was made up 
working out exactly where I knew him from and that he was in this. Um, so then as well we've got um, Marcus Hudson. And he's a relatively new name on the acting scene with credits such as 2023's The Little Mermaid, Domino Day and A Gentleman in Moscow. Um, and then Vivian is also a rising actor with roles in Rye Lane, Teen Spirit and the Doctor Who spin-off class, which is where I think I know her from. Because I watched that a little bit, I didn't watch it all. I was more into like you know, Doctor Who and then Sarah Jane Adventures when I was younger. So I didn't really watch class, but I watched a bit. And I think that's where I know her from because I did recognise her. And then, of course, sticking with the Doctor Who theme, Penelope Wilson. Oh, my goodness. Oh, Harriet Jones, former Prime Minister. Of course, I ex- fully expected her to deliver that line. I was, like, waiting for it. I was like, come on, say it. Because, like, in every episode that she was in Doctor Who for, I don't know how many times she said it, but she'd be like, Harriet Jones, former Prime Minister. <laughs> It was just, it was like this running gag and I loved it. I was, I was there for it. I loved it. So yeah, she's most notable for her role in Doctor Who as Harriet Jones, former Prime Minister, during David Tennant's reign as the Doctor. She's also known for Ricky Gervais's Afterlife, which I loved her in. She played such a lovely character. Um, Downton Abbey and the best exotic Marigold Hotel movies, as well as an appearance in Shaun of the Dead. I thought it was nice that this show included actors like Peter Serafinowix. That's what we'll go with. Yeah, we'll go with that. And a few similar roles, like who who were actually scouts and add to that setting. Do you know what I mean? Like you could tell some of the background actors and some of like the secondary actors like that weren't really a main focus actually had authentic Scouse accents, which is what we want because we don't want people doing a Scouse accent when they can't do it. And you can't do it if you're not from Liverpool. Even my accent is controversial. I get told I'm not Scouse enough, near enough every day, especially when I was working for the Liverpool Echo and I did a lot of Facebook Lives. I got berated by people <laughs> saying, like, I'm not Scouse enough, I'm a Plazzy Scouser, I'm a wool. First of all, I'm from Neverton, which is basically Bootle, which is like, it's in Merseyside. I don't have a purple bin, but I'm Scouse. I don't have a proper thick Scouse accent. I would say I have a soft Scouse accent, because it's not like thick do you know what I mean like I I know it's not but anyway enough about that um yeah I constantly get told that so I wouldn't want to see like people on screen trying to do an accent when they just can't do it the only exception to that is Martin Freeman in the responder because he actually did a pretty decent job it felt like you know he was close enough. We could allow it. He was an honorary scouser after that. He actually did a good job. And I believe he spent like a few months living in Liverpool trying to pick up the accent. Like, well done. The dedication. Yes, we love that. Um, but just trying to do the accent, that's no good. Like, you've got to learn it properly. Or you've got to have like grown up with it. For it to be real. Or it's just not going to work. So I liked that the main character's didn't try and put on the Scouse accent I couldn't imagine them doing that it wouldn't work it would be really crap (laughs) like we just it would take us out of it completely but what worked better is that we had these characters in Liverpool in the show being like portrayed as students who probably came to Liverpool and then didn't want to leave which is actually quite like a normal thing to happen that does usually happen people come to Liverpool and then they don't want to leave 
because it's such a warm, welcoming place and it's it's got amazing attractions and scenery and gorgeous cityscapes, so I can't really blame them. Um, but yeah, that felt natural that like it's implied that these two characters came here to study and then just didn't want to leave. Um, so I, I, I thought that like worked really, really well. And then we didn't have that issue of doing the Scouse accent, you know, um, because, of course, it is set in Liverpool. So, yeah. Um, I thought that the cast and choices for Dead Heart, like what I was saying before, like they were spot on. I can't imagine anyone else playing them. But each actor managed to bring their character to life and breathe energy into every scene, which can be hard to do they actually made every single scene exciting and interesting and you could connect to the character you could really connect with them and many of the actors especially Bilal and Vivian and Marcus brought so much seamless chemistry and magic to their characters it felt like these people really knew each other any of Bilal and Vivian's scenes together just felt so relaxed and at ease like they were really close friends with a special connection that only they could understand and these characters had the ability to really draw in and make us like actually care about them showing us the details of what they went through and their connection with each other this series like it, it just seamlessly blends the comedy, thriller, mystery genre, and it creates a unique and captivating story that keeps you wanting more. It was so easy for me to just press <laughs> the next episode button, as many of the episodes either left you want more question, left you want more, left you with more questions, or just like left you on a a cliffhanger and you had to know what happened next even if it's 2am you had to know you had to the unpredictability of the storyline throughout doesn't fail to entertain and it just keeps you on the edge of your seat wondering how else can this get even weirder and then it just does there were so many twists and turns most of which i didn't actually see coming and normally, I can work stuff out like that normally. I'm like, oh, so-and-so did it. <laughs> but this one, there was like a few times where it was like misleading you to think something else. Or it was just so unpredictable that you couldn't see it coming. So I liked how this story mainly focused on the primary plot featuring Elias and Jess. But had a nice layer of multi-stranded storylines weaving throughout the background with Elliot's grandmother, his auntie, and her internet fiancé, the corrupt detective, the McGargy family, the bloody finger, the cake finger, the weird bar, who's Will, and more. There was a lot going on. At the beginning, I did have a feeling that the grandmother had some kind of invol involvement in it, like in the whole disappearance, you know, and I had some secrets, but... I didn't expect her to have as big of a role as she did in Peter's disappearance. Now, of course, it makes sense given her homophobic attitude. I liked how this trait was kept quite subtle and we had a lot of other more likely killers, such as the corrupt detective and his family of criminals. So there was a lot where it's leading us to think that and then eventually, like, it slowly reveals what actually happened and it isn't as plain and simple of an explanation like there's a lot more to it there's different layers to it and it's not the reason that you think as to why he goes missing so yeah you definitely don't expect why he goes missing <laughs> i thought it was interesting how there were like multiple people responsible for different crimes that went on like it wasn't all just pinned on one person behind it because so many shows do that kind of like you know scooby-doo um traits you know of like 
being like, oh look, we will mask this person, they were behind it all along. And then you kind of leave it there. You know, and that's, that's okay for some things, yeah, it works for some things. But realistically, often, especially in some like a scenario like this, either people work together or there's many different things at play. And I liked how, how it did that. So after Will is killed, we find out that it was a case of mistaken identity. Oh, which is explained by him wearing a hat that that Jess wore. She actually stole it from the bar of someone. And then she kind of was known to wear it for a bit. And then Will stole it off air. So that was explained as being like, oh, it was actually Jess he was meant to be killed. So that was an interesting one. But at the same time, I couldn't help but think. How did they not know it was Jess though? Because they look very different, Will and Jess. The two different races. Male and female. So maybe they're just really far away, the assassin, I don't know. But yeah, um... And it was explained that one of the corrupt detectives, Lackey's, um, was behind that. And the person behind setting up Will to seduce Elliot turned out to be Elliot's aunt. Which I, I mean, looking back, there were some instances where we could see, um, what's her name? I've got it in my notes here. Bonnie Fred, which, by the way, amazing name. I love that. I've never heard that name before, but I feel like it's going to pop up more now. You know, like when you hear something for the first time ever, and then you see it all the time. I feel like that's going to happen. I'm going to see a load of Bonnie Freds now. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I kind of, looking back, you can see it's hinted, it's foreshadowed that she does not like Elliot. She has a hatred brewing within here for him. And you can see that building up, but it's subtle. I don't know if you can hear in the background. I am in the cosy corner, but I have a window open. And there's a load of birds. Some have been fighting, some have been singing. So if you hear those, my apologies, but I'm not going to interrupt nature. Um, even though they're interrupting me right now. Like, trying to record a podcast here, guys. Thank you. Um... So yes, back to Bonnie Fred. Bonnie Fred? Bonifred? Bon- Bonifred. Bonnie Fred. Anyway. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I liked that like she was behind that because it was foreshadowing the whole... The bit where they were tasting the cakes and she looked at Elliot and then made like a knife slitting motion by her neck as if to be like, I'm going to kill you sort of thing. And, you know, that is a bit of a red flag, but you kind of dismiss it you're just like oh she's just being mean that's just bonifred she's being mean so yeah i like that looking back you can actually pick up on some things then because i actually have watched this more than once i've watched this twice and i'm planning on watching it a third time because i love it that much so on my second watch i really enjoyed going over the little details that I missed like the subtle hints that Bonifred is actually you know mean and out to get Elliot and she has these ulterior motives that we don't really see at first so I would definitely recommend watching it more than once because you do pick up on more things so obviously she intended to expose Elliot's sexuality to her mum who was Elliot's grandmother to ensure that she was the new favourite and showered with money and gifts and compliments rather than Elliot because it's actually shown in, in the series that Elliot's grandmother seems to like fund Elliot's lifestyle and rent and everything even though he has a job well had a job um he just he does get let go but he did have a job where he was working um in a pet salon so 
he was making money. But it seemed like his grandmother was like really looking after him and like even going a bit too far probably. So what is implied is that Bonnie Fred wants that money instead. She's she's being cut off, she's not getting that money. And it's probably because of the way she's been acting and the whole internet boyfriend thing, who she's planning on marrying and, and all that, so she wanted to get rid of the other source of that money, like where that money's going to, Elliot, to keep it all for herself. So Tina's introduction in the show as a relative of Jess's, oh, that really threw a spanner in the wakes. And it felt like such a dead end for the search for Peter. Or at least more information about his disappearance. And one of the biggest twists in the show came when we found out about Tina and her unexpected relationship with Peter. I mean, Peter had been with Elliot, so he's gay. So now we're learning, well, so isn't he gay? Is he bi? Is he pansexual? Like, I mean, gender and sexuality is a construct and it's a spectrum. But we we were just told right away in the series he's gay. That's it. There was no inferring of any other sexuality. So this then was a shock. And it really added a twist to everything. It changed everything. Another shock. But one that I slowly worked out when is when we found out that Tina is actually not in fact Jess's relative. But the detective's sister and was Tina's and it was Tina's son who had the DNA match to Jess as the father was Yep Peter <laughs> That yeah mm-hmm mm-hmm So I was surprised that it was behind the cat prank on Elliot as well because I didn't feel like that character was like they didn't come across as that mean spirited you know, enough to do that. But given the motive of being ghosted by Elliot, it kind of made sense and it added a good little mystery to the entire plot that, like, threw things off a bit, which I think worked well. Because you feel like it's all tied in, but then you realise at the end, like, there was a lot of different things going on, done by different people. And then, although things are connected, there are some things that aren't as connected. So it, it, it throws things off a bit. What I liked about the use of fairies in the show, not fairies as in fairies with wings, but fairy as in like people who like to dress up as animals. Those kind. So what I liked about that in the show is that it wasn't just included for the sake of it. They didn't just throw a fairy in there and be like, there we go. We've included LGBTQ plus representation, see? It wasn't like that. It was done for a reason. For the plot. So the fairy suit actually became a really useful plot point later on in the story. Where it allowed Elliot to escape after being touched on earlier in the show. So I also think it was introduced very well in the series and explained respectfully as well. It wasn't just touched on and left alone. One of the characters was able to explain a bit more about it. And I just feel like that was done quite well. And it's not something that you see a lot in series. So it was nice to see it represented. And there is so much happening in this show. I've only briefly touched on the tip of the iceberg so far. Yet all of these different storylines connect and lead into one another and they work so well i particularly enjoyed the subplot of the detective and his corrupt family because it sets a much darker undertone for the whole story without that you wouldn't get the same story and then of course it ends up that storyline weaving into the main storyline and it has a big payoff at the end one of my favorite things about this production was the incredible use of Liverpool as Liverpool, which is never really done. 
Each episode used many different locations, including in and around the city, such as the Albert Dock, Bold Street, Queen Avenue, St George's Hall, Our Lady and St Nicholas Church, and many different parts of Liverpool. I actually, um, I mentioned before that I have watched the series twice. The main reason why I had to watch it a second time is because the first time round, I was far too distracted from the plot because I was looking at all of the different Liverpool locations and I was like, oh, I've been there. I know that that's Bold Street. Oh, that's Queen Avenue. I was there last week. <laughs> like, I was just in my own little world pointing out all these different locations and then I realised, oh, I haven't been paying attention to the plot. <laughs> Because it was so beautiful. Liverpool really is such a stunning city. And it is not shown enough in TV and film. At least not as Liverpool. It's always shown as like Liverpool as New York or 1920s London or whatever. Because we've got a lot of mix of different architecture. You know, we've got Gothic, we've got modern there's all different types here, mainly because of the war, like we had to rebuild then. And like, of course, we've got the stunning architectural designs such as the lava beds and all that. But often it it's mainly done because of how well preserved a lot of the streets are, like Rodney Street, Hope Street, all that, Georgian Quarter. They're often used in period dramas. So then Liverpool doesn't really get the recognition it deserves on screen. Until now. I thought it was fantastic to actually have it set in Liverpool. And have the city as the spectacular backdrop for the story. Because this time we actually get to see Liverpool in all of its gothic and modern architectural glory. And I just think that that was such a good idea. We just don't get to see it enough. So I was really proud watching Liverpool on my tv screen at home i was like yes there we go and you're seeing it more and more now in different productions i mean we've just had some like um go out on on their itv that was filmed i believe in and around like the crosby area and, and within liverpool um there was different parts where you get to see live like you know parts of the, of liverpool and then as well um there was a drama oh my goodness what was it called it was a prison drama and some of it was filmed in Liverpool I've forgotten the name of it now I can't believe this Bella Ramsey was in it I'm gonna do a quick google because I need to know the name Bella Ramsey because I know that she was in it um there was Bella Ramsey and then there was Jodie Whitaker. Oh, time. That was it. So, yeah. Season one and two. I believe they were both filmed, like, in, around Liverpool. And, yeah, we're seeing that more and more now. But I think after this show, the way it showed Liverpool, I really do think that's going to kick off more and more productions wanting to actually set things in Liverpool as Liverpool so I'm hoping to see more of that because I think Liverpool deserves it and it's such stunning architecture and such a lovely city it deserves to be on screen that's my rant over what now um so moving on the only thing that didn't make as much sense to me in the show (laughs) was the route that some characters take to get to places because if you live in Liverpool you would know that the route that Elliot takes in a brief montage scene would not take him where he ends up and it would probably take quite a long time to walk he goes from the Albert Dock to St George's Hall like that was a seamless cut it was as if that was like a few steps it's definitely not um (laughs) and I can't expect them to know this because to be fair um, like I, I know that the creator is from New York 
many of the people working on it are from Manchester, different parts of the North West or different parts of the UK. It can't be expected that you're going to know that. But also, it's supposed to be a film world. You know, it's supposed to be in this film world that is a seamless route. It shows off the city. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's not actually... You're not supposed to be taking it seriously as, like, that is an actual route. But to me, I did find it funny the way he walks from the Albert Dock to St George's Hall. Then he hops on a train to another area of the docks to get to his apartment. It just felt a bit of an unnatural route. But, hey, it's a TV show and it's not about the logistics. It's about showing the gorgeous city of Liverpool. And I can't complain there. So, same with the boat though from the Albert Dock to Ireland. I don't know how realistic that is. But it works for the plot. So, we're going to go with it. (laughs) I did enjoy that. The way they were saying, Oh, we won't get a ferry because it'll take too long. We'll jump a boat from the Albert Dock. We'll get there quicker. And I was like, Will you? I, I don't know about that. I mean... I'm not an expert. I'm really not. I have no idea how this works. But surely there's some sort of like, I don't know, like customs or something that you need to go through. And like, wouldn't they be like, hmm, that's a bit suspicious. Why is like a random boat just docking to Ireland? You're not a ferry. But, like, you know, it's a film world. It's TV. Let's not question it too much. I did. I overanalyzed it. But that's what I'm here for. I'm a, I was a film graduate. You know, I've got to question these things. I overanalyze everything I watch and it's exhausting. But there we go. So that was the only thing that didn't really make sense to me. But I enjoyed it for the plot. You know, it made sense for the plot. I liked it. It was creative. It was fun. And I thought that that was actually one of the most, like, fun parts of it. And I enjoyed seeing the docs. So, no real complaints. The LGBTQ plus representation is absolutely flawless and dead hot. From the main character's gay relationship, queer pride and homophobic undertones that are addressed in the series, yes, we love it. We love to see any kind of representation and just loved how it was incorporated. Many of the characters' best traits derived from their queerness and openness Particularly the character, um, oh, what was his name? Raphael? Was it Raphael? I think it was. The shop owner who is Jess's boss. Um, I thought that was really done well and, again, respectful. And it tied in with the theory as well and, like, how that's kind of explored and how people can be... Because obviously there's two in the show, if you've seen the show, you'll know that there's two different people who kind of are are within that fairy world and explore their LGBTQ plus roots differently. Um, There's those who are more open and then those who are much more reserved about it. And I like that they've shown that variety. So moving on now to the cinematography within this show. It absolutely blew me away. I thought that every shot was just beautifully lit and designed purposely to portray an intended mood. One scene comes to mind the most for me in terms of cinematography and it was like a pure masterpiece in my opinion and it was the priest murder scene. This scene offered a stark juxtaposition between a few elements such as violence and it was a brutal act against such a holy setting with the modern take on the classic opera of a Maria. Flawless, stunning, amazing, just juxtaposing, I mean like cinematically I ate that up. I loved it. Didn't love what was happening to the priest. But cinematically, yes. 
<laughs> I thought that the soundtrack as well for the series was just epic. Like, it was just... Every, every track was a banger. <laughs> like, and then when it was more of, like, um, like a score instead of, like, you know, songs, that was delivered really well. Like, it, it was able to capture the essence of the scene and translate it into, into like, a mood that we were feeling. And, yeah, it, that worked really, really well. So, throughout the show, we, they, they used a few different pop culture hits, like Baby One More Time by Britney Spears. Yes, that icon of a song. And some funky, upbeat tunes as well. There's actually a song in episode two. I don't know the name of it. And I spent two days scouring the internet, searching, just needing to know who was behind this song. It, like, I can't tell you the amount of hours and manpower I put into this. And I couldn't find it. And I was almost going to give up. And I had people, like I told other people about it, I had them looking. And then I decided, I've already connected with one of the producers from Dead Hot on like LinkedIn and that. And we talked a little bit. Um, and I told them how much I'm a fan of the show and all that. So I decided I'm just going to ask them. So I asked them and they were able to find out the information for me. So they told me that it is actually a commissioned song it's a very small song like it's just like a snippet like it's very small but it's commissioned from a local liverpool band and um, I, I think they might be unsigned maybe that's changed at the moment but yeah and um, finally found out their name um just just prepare yourself for the name piss kitty yeah i wasn't expecting that that is quite a name. Quite a name. Yeah. Quite a name. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> I didn't expect that. I don't know what to think of the name. Was shit dog taken? Like, <laughs> but anyway, um, the song speaks for itself, though. I followed them because I was like, I'm obsessed. I'm not a massive fan of the name, but hey, that's your business. And I really liked the song. I thought that the song encapsulated what Dead Hot was. And I honestly would love if that song could be expanded and turned into an actual full song because I would listen to it. So I'm just going to read you the lyrics that I could make out because some of them, there's dialogue over the scene so you can't fully hear every single lyric. But this is a little snippet that I'm going to give you a rendition of um, with my awful, awful voice. And I just feel like it encapsulates not only Dead Heart but also Liverpool. It's cool. I like it. So here we go. Meet me by the mezzy in the sun with a cool breeze. And like that's the tune and it's so cool. It's such a cool beat. I love it. So, yeah, I really enjoyed that. <laughs> I thought it just, it matched so well as well. The scene that it was over, it was, they were on their way from the club, I think, or a club or something, to the vets or something. Or No, it wasn't the vets, was it? Heavenly tails something like that it was where pets can get euthanized because they were trying to find the cat so they were on the way to there and as you do in liverpool this is actually quite a big part of modern day liverpool culture you'll know this if you've been anywhere whether you're a driver or whether you're a pedestrian if you're just trying to walk on the walkway and you get run over well Scooters are a big part of Liverpool culture now, whether we like it or not. Many people do not. I'm kind of neutral on the subject, 
But yeah, um, so Elliot and Jess, instead of walking, they use some of the electric scooters that are dotted all around the city centre. And they're on those electric scooters having the time of their lives heading towards their next location. And then over that is the song. Um, Meet me by the mizzy in the sun with the cool breeze. I was like, oh, that is perfect. Love that. So yeah, I, I don't think that could have gone over a better scene. It just really captured like Liverpool life. And it was like, that is a vibe. So, thought that that was great. Um, and I wanted to, of course, try and credit the uh, the artists for that because I thought that they did a great job. And well done to them getting their song on Dead Hot. They must be really proud. That's brilliant. So overall, this gripping series is filled with so much thrilling drama unexpected twists and turns, funny moments, ups and downs of friendships and all that. It really made me feel just so connected to the characters and it provided a really engaging mystery that unfolded with each tantalising episode. I just feel like the creator and writer, Charlotte Coburn, did a fantastic job and she really secured herself a place within this kind of genre splicing format. And I can't wait to see what else she does. Because I've enjoyed everything she's done so far. So I can't wait for more. Well I hope that you enjoyed my review of Dead Hot. It was really fun to watch. And as a film graduate. I thoroughly enjoyed over analysing it. And watching it. And just consuming it. (laughs) It was just such a good show. And I love talking about it. So if you want to share your opinion, go comment on our recent post about this episode and share your thoughts too. Make sure you don't miss an episode. Tap that subscribe button, follow us on all the socials linked in the show notes. Thank you so much for listening and stay tuned for more review episodes like this. Stay cosy. Mm -hmm.